Some presidential assassins are quickly killed themselves, while others eventually become published authors or even a part of cinematic history. In April 1865, Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth assassinated President Abraham Lincoln at Ford's Theater. Booth was a successful actor, but he was also an ardent supporter of slavery. His original plan wasn't to kill Lincoln, but instead to kidnap him. However, he ultimately decided to kill the president after finding out about his plan to attend a performance at Ford's Theater. Booth and his conspirators quickly organized to basically wipe out the leadership in the U.S. Lincoln, his vice president Andrew Johnson, and Secretary of State William Seward. The attempt on Johnson never went forward, and Seward survived his attack, but Lincoln was shot in the back of the head while watching the play from his private box. Booth ran away, and a manhunt that involved nearly 1,000 Union soldiers ensued for about two weeks. Federal troops finally found Booth hiding in a tobacco farm in Virginia. When he refused to surrender, he was shot by a soldier and died from his injuries hours later. His co-conspirators were arrested and later hanged. Booth was secretly buried in Washington, D.C., but his body was returned to his family years later to be buried in an unmarked grave. In July 1881, disgruntled lawyer Charles Guiteau shot President James A. Garfield twice inside a railroad station and then immediately surrendered. Guiteau had delusions that he deserved a spot in the presidential office because he'd written a speech during the campaign, and he was furious when his requests for a post were ignored. Garfield lived for 80 days after the shooting, as doctors tried to remove the bullet lodged near his pancreas, but the unsanitary methods of the time resulted in a lethal infection. Once Garfield was dead, Guiteau's defense attorneys pleaded insanity to try to save their client from the death penalty. This was a bold move at the time that wasn't exactly well received by the public or the prosecution team. But the prosecution didn't have to worry as Guiteau insisted on defending himself and claimed that he wasn't insane. He also rambled on about why the president had to die and how God told him to do it. Guiteau was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to death. Six months later, he was hanged. I conceived the idea of removing the president because he has proved a traitor to the men that made him. On September 6, 1901, anarchist mill worker Leon Cholgas shot President William McKinley twice during a visit to the Pan American Exposition. Cholgas was obsessed with the disparity between workers and the wealthy and believed that McKinley was partly responsible. The president died a week later from complications from his bullet wounds. Cholgas was arrested on the spot, and his trial began just one week after McKinley's death. He confessed right away. The trial lasted only eight hours, and the jury needed only 30 minutes to determine that he was guilty. On October 29th, he was executed in the electric chair. But Cholgash's story doesn't quite end there. As it turned out, Thomas Edison produced a reenactment of Cholgash's execution on film, thereby preserving the assassin's place in history in a very unexpected way. John F. Kennedy was shot on November 22, 1963, while riding the streets of Dallas in the back of an open convertible. His death has since been the subject of conspiracy theories for decades. He was the only president shot from a distance using a rifle and telescopic sight, which meant that there were no witnesses. And the lack of up-close witnesses only helped fuel the conspiracy that still rages today. The shot came from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, where pro-Soviet radical Lee Harvey Oswald worked. Later the same day, Oswald shot a Dallas policeman and was subsequently arrested and charged with the president's murder, which he strongly denied committing. Two days after Kennedy's death, Oswald was shot and killed himself by nightclub operator Jack Ruby while in custody at Dallas police headquarters. As a result, Oswald was never tried for the assassination. The Warren Commission, which was formed to look into the assassination, eventually determined that Oswald had acted alone, even though initial findings indicated that there was possibly a second shooter near the motorcade. The commission was eventually able to trace the rifle from the sixth floor to an alias used by Oswald. It was also able to connect handwriting and a palm print found on the rifle to him, thereby confirming his guilt in the assassination and closing the case. There is no doubt about it. In January 1835, Andrew Jackson could have been the first American president to be assassinated while in office. But instead, unemployed painter Richard Lawrence failed to shoot him twice, as both of the guns that he was carrying misfired. Jackson was in poor health, but he was still able to use his cane to beat Lawrence to the ground until other people at the scene intervened and secured Lawrence. It turned out that Lawrence was under the delusion that he was meant to be the next king of England and that Jackson was preparing to take the throne away from him. Jackson doubted that claim and suspected a conspiracy, though investigations turned up nothing. In 1835, an attempt to shoot somebody without actually causing any harm was not a major offense, so Lawrence could have gotten away with just a fine and a short prison term, but by the time his trial came around, it was obvious to the examining physicians that he was insane. He was ultimately committed to a mental institution where he lived until his death. In March 1981, John Hinckley Jr. shot President Ronald Reagan for a rather odd reason. He wanted to impress actor Jodie Foster. 
Hinckley had once dreamed of becoming a songwriter, but then he became obsessed with the movie Taxi Driver, which starred a young Foster. He somehow convinced himself that the key to her part was to kill the president. On the day that Hinckley tried to kill Reagan, he even sent Foster a letter that said, I will admit to you that the reason I'm going ahead with this attempt now is because I just cannot wait any longer to impress you. Later that day, he waited for Reagan to exit the Washington Hilton Hotel and fired six times. A bullet entered the president's lung, and Hinckley also ended up shooting Reagan's press secretary, a secret service agent, and a police officer, though everyone survived. Hinckley was arrested, but found not guilty by reason of insanity and sent to a psychiatric facility. Despite attempting suicide twice, he was eventually allowed to leave the facility unsupervised to visit his parents. In June 2022, he was granted a full release. He since announced his intention to pursue a music career. I'm trying to show the public that I'm, I'm not the person that I was so many years ago. In May 2005, President George W. Bush was overseas in the country of Georgia when he was attacked in Freedom Square in the capital city of Tbilisi. He was beginning a speech in the company of the Georgian president, as well as both countries' first ladies and a number of other dignitaries. Luckily for everyone in attendance, the grenade that Georgian national Vladimir Arut Union threw toward the podium failed to detonate. That was partly because he'd been hiding it under a handkerchief, which tangled up in the firing pin and prevented it from fully deploying. Arut Union then fled the scene. He was eventually captured in July thanks to the combined efforts of the FBI's overseas office and Georgian authorities. During the arrest, he managed to shoot and kill a Georgian police officer. It's unclear how well a root union had planned the attack, as the presidents were standing behind a bulletproof glass, and the grenade would have likely bounced on the glass or caused little injury to them even if it exploded against it. A root union's reasons for the attack are also unclear beyond the fact that he claimed hateful presidents. He initially confessed, but then pleaded not guilty. In January 2006, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. One of the strangest attempts to assassinate a president happened in December 1975, when Lynette Squeaky Fromey tried to kill Gerald Ford. She was a member of Charles Manson's cult, but that's not why she showed up at a public event in California with a gun. According to Fromey, she just wanted to talk about the plight of the California Redwoods and maybe get a second trial for Manson, and she thought the only way Ford would listen to her was if she brought a gun with her for attention. Secret Service agents had Fromey on the ground pretty quickly. There's some dispute if she even pointed the gun at Ford or pulled the trigger. But either way, Ford escaped unharmed. She was given a life sentence with an extra 15 years added for a brief escape from prison in 1987. Fromey remained in touch with Manson throughout her entire time in prison. Despite her life sentence, she was eventually released on parole in 2009 and has led a quiet life since then. In 2019, she admitted to ABC's Nightline that she was still in love with Manson. And I know how that sounds to people who think he's the epitome of evil. Since Fromey's release, she's published a memoir and moved to Marcy, New York, where she lives with her boyfriend. Just 17 days later, another woman pointed a gun at President Ford. Sarah Jane Moore waited outside a hotel in California for the president to leave, and then she fired at him but missed. Somebody in the crowd grabbed her before Secret Service agents jumped in and arrested her. She was a mother of four and a former FBI informant with a deep disdain for the political establishment. Moore was sentenced to life in prison, but she was eventually released on parole in 2007, just two years before Fromm was released. She's kept a low profile since then, but in 2019, the then 89-year-old Moore was arrested for breaking her parole, which required her to inform her parole officer before traveling abroad. She was reportedly returning from Israel when she was arrested at the airport. It never occurred to me that this was a story that was going to go all over the world. In October 1912, John Flamung Schrank shot Theodore Roosevelt as the president was leaving his hotel while on his way to deliver a speech. The bullet broke a rib and ended up getting lodged in his chest. The shot could have been deadly if not for Roosevelt's overcoat pockets, which were filled with a thick manuscript and a metal eyeglasses case, both of which slowed down the bullet and minimized the damage. The president actually went on to give his speech before agreeing to go to the hospital, where he spent one week being cared for by doctors. Schrank was arrested on the spot, after which police officers discovered a letter on him. That letter gave two reasons for the attempted assassination. Schrank didn't want Roosevelt to stay in office, and he'd had a dream in which William McKinley told him that Roosevelt was responsible for his death and needed to be punished. After Schrank was declared incompetent to stand trial and diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, authorities committed him to an asylum where he spent the rest of his life. He died of bronchial pneumonia in 1943 his obituary noted that he never received any visitors during his 29 years in the hospital. In 1933, another president named Roosevelt was shot at. This time, no bullets hit their primary target. The shooter was Giuseppe Zangara, a laborer who was angry at the dire financial situation that many people, including himself, were in during the Great Depression. He even reportedly shouted, too many people are starving as he fired several shots. 
Of the five people who were injured, one would eventually die, Chicago Mayor Anton Sermat. Zangara was grabbed and beaten by several people at the scene and eventually arrested. It turned out that the reason the bullet hadn't struck President Franklin D. Roosevelt was because a local woman who saw the gun managed to grab Zangara's arm and moved it upward to ensure he wouldn't hit his target. After being sentenced to prison for attempted murder, Zangara was retried for killing Sermak and sentenced to death. As he sat in the electric chair for his execution in March 1933, he reportedly started screaming, all capitalists, lousy bunch, crooks. However, he reportedly offered no resistance at any point. He died minutes later and an autopsy was ordered, after which the attending physicians declared that his brain was perfectly normal.